Good morning, church. So glad you guys are here. Happy May Day. You may be saying May Day at this point because your kids are driving you nuts, but April was probably the longest month of my life, but it is May at this point, and we're getting close, I think, uh, to lifting all the stuff that's going on, but happy May Day. We're so glad you guys are here with us today. Let's get started. I've searched the world But it couldn't fill me Man's empty praise And treasures that fade Are never enough And you came along And put me back together desire is now satisfied here in your love oh there's nothing better than you there's nothing better than you lord there's nothing nothing is better than you I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws, Lord, you've seen them all, you still call me friend, cause God of the mountain is the God of the valley. And there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes You turn shame into glory You're the only one who cares You turn graves into gardens You turn bones into armies You turn seas into highways you're the only one who cares Oh, there's nothing better than you There's nothing better than you, Lord There's nothing, nothing is better than you You turn graves into God you turn bones into armies You turn seas into highways You're the only one who cares You're the only one who cares You're the only one who this with me. I cast my mind. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me. 
all I see his wounds his hands his feet my savior on that cursed tree his body bound and drenched in tears they laid him down in joseph's tomb the entrance sealed by heavy stone messiah still and all alone let's sing this together oh praise the name Praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. For endless days we will sing Your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God. On the third, at break of dawn, the Son of Heaven rose again. Oh, trample death, where is your sting? The angels roar for Christ our King. Praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. For endless days we will sing Your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God. He shall return in robes of white the blazing sun shall pierce the night and i will rise among the saints my gaze transfixed on jesus Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. For endless days we will sing Your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God. Again, we're just so thankful that you're here with us online, uh, worshiping with us. This is a typical time we would greet, um, but we just want you to go to the comment section. Let us know you're here. Um, and I want to know what time your kids are waking up in the morning. Mine are waking up at like 6 a.m., and it is, it's killing me. Um, so let me know what time your kids are waking up. My daughter has actually learned to, learn to make breakfast. We actually woke up the other morning and smelt toast. Um, so uh, let me know uh, what time you guys or kids are waking up. And uh, love you guys. Can't wait to see your faces. Good morning, church. Thank you for joining us online this morning. It is a beautiful, warm morning. The last few days have been very warm. I hope you've been spending some time outside. 
Well, surprise, surprise, as you can tell, I am not Patrick Lightfoot. <laughs> no, I am Aaron Bauer. I'm actually our student director here at Traverse Christian Church, and it is my turn to speak to you today. I'm really excited about it. In fact, six months ago, seven months ago, when we were at our staff retreat in September, uh, we'd put on the calendar that I might actually be doing my first uh, sermon or preaching in May. And so we had planned on this months and months ago. And the one thing that I didn't take into consideration was that I would make my preaching debut as a televangelist. So here we are. I'm a televangelist. One day I'll get as big as Joel Osteen, I'm sure. But anyway, we're going to get underway here this morning. Um, we're in a series called Anxious for Nothing. And what this series has been about is about anxiety and uncertainty, and what a great time to have a message like this when we are facing such uncertain times in our world today. Um, we're now in week three of this series, and I want to tell you a little bit about anxiety from the spiritual side of things. There are many different ways to look at anxiety. There is physiological, there is emotional, situational, and psychological. And those are all ways that anxiety affects different people. Um, but I want to focus today, and what this series has been focusing on, is the spiritual side of anxiety. And we've been letting Scripture drive us. So there is one piece of Scripture in Philippians, Philippians 4, that we've been looking at for the last three weeks. Now, these verses are written by Paul. And to give you a little bit of background about this passage, Paul was on his way to Rome. And he was going to Rome because he was a preacher, first of all. And second of all, he really wanted to go meet with the Roman leaders. You see, he thought that if he could get the Roman leaders to be on board with Jesus and the message of Christ, that he could reach the ends of the world. Because Rome at that time was the capital of commerce. It was, the, it was the place to be. It was really the controlling realm of their world at that time. So he thought, hey, if I go to Rome, if I can get in front of the Roman leaders and I can convert them, uh, or not convert them, but if I can share the gospel with them, then we can, there's really nothing stopping us. Unfortunately, what ends up happening is Paul ends up in prison. Now, what a difference in a day, right? You wake up being a preacher and you go to bed a prisoner. That'd be a heck of a way to end your day. Well, I want to look at this verse in, in Philippians. Now that we've given you a little bit of background, know that Paul, when he's writing to the Philippians, he is bound, he's chained up, he is in prison by himself, he's isolated. Talk about a time to be anxious, to feel anxiety. I couldn't imagine any other place, especially in a foreign country, being in, in a jail cell and not knowing what's going to happen. But Paul writes one of the greatest messages to the Philippians in this context, out of anxiety, out of prison. And it's in Philippians 4, verse 4. It says, rejoice in the Lord always. Always? Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Now, does that sound like your mom to some of you? I know I sound like that all the time to my kids. Pick up your clothes. Pick up your clothes. It's so important that Paul is saying, rejoice in the Lord always. Like your mom, don't make me say it again, but I'll say it again. Rejoice. Really, Paul? Really, always? We're always supposed to rejoice? Man, what about, what about this summer when it's 95 degrees out and you're on the side of I-25 with a flat tire? Am I supposed to rejoice then, Paul? <laughs> what about... What about if, I'm, uh, if, if I find out that my spouse has been lying to me? Am I supposed to rejoice then? What about if I find out my child's on drugs? Or I've got an alcoholic friend? Or maybe somebody close to me has cancer. Am I supposed to rejoice then? You see, this verse is quoted many times. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. In fact, it's so popular that you've probably seen it on a bumper sticker, maybe a coffee mug, maybe a refrigerator magnet right now at the home that you're sitting in watching this message. But don't we hate it when people say this back to us? I don't want to hear this. Hey, Aaron, you had a really rough week. How's, how's things going? Oh, you know, it's, it's been bad, man. I've been having a lot of anxiety. Well, rejoice in the Lord always. Rejoice? I'll give you something to rejoice about. Tell me that again. It's easier said than done. But Paul, out of the context of being beaten and thrown in prison in Rome and never knowing if he's going to see the light of day again, has this attitude. And what we're talking about here is um, how Paul could praise while in prison. 
The rest of the verses in this message that we're focusing on is Philippians 4, 5 through 7. So I'll read the rest of that real quick here. In verse 5, it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. How can you write such a positive message from prison? That's something that I can't even wrap my head around, especially in times like I'm sure you all have had times where life is just difficult and you're having a really difficult time. Well, the reason he's able to write this message is because he has a different perspective. And the title of today's message in this series is called The Perspective of Praise. Now, what does that mean? Simply, perspective simply means how you see something, how you see it. There are many different ways to see a situation, but there are many different perspectives to how you see certain things in life. And anxiety is exactly one of those things. It's all in the way that you perceive it. Now, I don't want to confuse you. I don't want to say that there's no such thing as anxiety because I, for one, have suffered and do suffer from anxiety. Um, It's something that I've dealt with for about five years now, and it's something that I hope will go away someday, but it is a very real thing in my life. So I want to acknowledge that first of all. I'm not saying that the anxiety is not a real thing. But there are many different perspectives and ways that we can deal with anxiety. And again, from this side, from the spiritual side, we're looking at the perspective of praise. Now let's talk about perception. Remember I told you that there are many different perspectives. I want to give you some ideas of different perspectives that you may have seen. I want to show you a picture up here. The first one is a shoe and a dress. Yes, these two pictures broke the internet. It's actually been five years now since this dress made its debut on Reddit. And it went all over Facebook. It went all over Twitter. In fact, it was the number one trending picture on Twitter for weeks at a time. It had millions and millions of views because even right now on your couch at home, you may be arguing what exactly is the color of that dress. I don't know. Depends on your perspective. Some people see black and blue. Some people see gold and white. What's the real answer? Well, you can Google the real answer. How about the shoe? The shoe also made its debut. Does that look gray and teal to you, or does it look pink and white? Again, some people see both. Some people see one or the other. I want to show you a different perspective again here. Let's look at this next photo. This next photo is of a place that I have only dreamed about going to. One day, I would love to go see the pyramids in Egypt. Everything from National Geographic specials, History Channel specials, to even movies like Aladdin, where, they have, where they're placed in the Middle East and you see all these ancient um, buildings that were built. I've always wanted to go see this stuff. Well, this picture is what you always see on every television show, on every movie, everywhere. It looks so beautiful, so barren. It's a desert. These, these pillars are in the middle of nowhere. Wrong. Let's look at it from a different perspective. As you can see, that beautiful picture of these pyramids in Egypt are not in the middle of nowhere in a barren desert. In fact, there is so much urban sprawl around Egypt that they are actually darn near in downtown, right? What a crazy perspective. Let's look at one more. How about this one? Have you ever taken a beautiful walk in a forest like this? One of the most gorgeous pictures that I've ever seen of a, of a beautiful big sidewalk. Do any of you recognize this? It looks so tranquil, so peaceful, such a place to relax and maybe seek God. But if we look at it from a different perspective, this place is no longer peaceful. Look at that. That is Central Park in New York City. Can you imagine being in this concrete jungle, but having this little piece of tranquility? The first picture that we looked at didn't have all that concrete jungle, all those buildings, all that busyness of life. But from this perspective, you can see that it's only a small piece. All right, one more picture here. This is what I want to focus on. This picture right here is called the Necker Cube. I actually didn't know what it was called until I started researching for this message. But I would be willing to bet if you're like me, you've probably dri- drawn, <laughs> excuse me, drawn this at least 100,000 times all throughout school on every doodle sheet that you have. Am I right? I've done that too. I I literally have this box on probably every notepad I've ever written in. 
just because it was fun to draw. Now, the Necker cube was developed, uh, excuse me, by Lewis Albert Necker in 1832. That's how old this drawing is. And it looks like a cube, but many people see it in two different perspectives. In fact, do you see this cube? Talk amongst yourselves and your family. Do you see this cube as facing down and to the left? Or do you see it as facing up and to the right? There's no right or wrong answer here. In fact, that's the magic of the Necker cube is that it can be seen from multiple perspectives and still be true. Now, in order to get a good perspective, the word perceive actually comes from the Latin root word that means the exact same thing. It literally means to look through. Now, if you stare at that photo again, um, it comes up and you, if you actually look through it, then maybe you can start to see two different perspectives. Now, I want to give you a different version of the Bible now that maybe you haven't heard of before. We read that passage earlier um, in Philippians 4, verses 4 through 7, and I'm going to give it to you a little bit different way. Let's imagine if Paul had a terrible perspective. Let's imagine if he didn't have a perspective of praise. In fact, I found this passage in the, in the uh, NPV version of the Bible. Have you ever heard of the NPV? Like NLT, NIV, King James Version? No, you probably haven't heard of NPV because I just made it up. It's actually called the negative perspective version. Here's what that might have sounded like. In Philippians 1, verse 12 and 13, this is what Paul might have said. Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me really sucks. God let me down. I'm overwhelmed with anxiety, depression, and hopelessness because of the hell I've been through. I'm quitting my Traverse crew, and I'm never going back to church. Is that the perspective that a lot of us have when we have things that are uncertain and bad and maybe anxieties in our life? I know I'm guilty of it. Absolutely. Having the wrong perspective. Man, things really suck right now. But if we have a perspective of praise, like Paul did, this is what is said. This is the actual version that Paul said. It says, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. It is become, as a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Now, the reason why we backed up here, you see that we're in Philippians 1, because this is actually a, um, a time that he was writing to the Philippians. We already talked about him being thrown into jail, but you can see that he is thankful. He has a different perspective right now, which is why he's able to write, rejoice in the Lord always. And the reason is because this isn't the first time he's been in jail. In fact, he tells us to rejoice in the Lord even when things are not looking good, even when he doesn't have a, lot, uh, a way out. The perspective of praise gives you a good attitude. And Paul's attitude in this verse right here is so amazing. He's saying, guys, look, all the stuff that I've been through, all the bad things that I've been through, all the prison cells that I've been in, it has been for one thing. God is still working and I can praise him because I have actually been able to, to advance the gospel. The things that you are going through today may just be something that can help you advance the gospel. I mentioned this wasn't the first time Paul was in prison and praising. In fact, if we go back to uh, Acts chapter 16, um, I will show you a previous time that him and his buddy Silas actually went into prison. I'm going to take us back to Acts chapter 16. Um, what happens here is, it's, I'll just give you a brief overview, and then we'll read a couple of verses here. But essentially, Paul and Silas are on their way to their small group. Here at Traverse, we call them crews. So Paul and Silas, they're headed out to their crew, and they're getting ready to meet with a bunch of people and pray and worship God. That's what they're doing on this particular day. Well, as they're going to their crew, they walk past this lady who they, is, they see is demon-possessed. They go ahead and pray for her and cast this demon out. Well, out of that, a mob happens because the owners, the servant owners of this lady are mad that she can no longer torture people and torment people and, and read their futures because this, um, this demon has been cast out of her. So a mob breaks out. Paul and Silas end up getting arrested and they end up getting taken to jail while they were on their way to their crew. And they find a different perspective. And this is what it says. Acts 16, 22, it says, A mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas, and the city officials ordered them stripped and beaten 
with wooden rods. Now, I hope none of you today are going to get stripped and beaten with wooden rods. I hope that's not something that's in your future. I certainly wouldn't want that. But maybe today you've been stripped of your confidence. Maybe you've been stripped of your hope. Maybe even you've been stripped of your faith because of these anxieties that you have and these worries that you have. Maybe you've been beaten down by discouragement. Maybe you've been beaten down by doubts, by other anxieties. Maybe those are the ways that we've been stripped and beaten these days. You see, Paul and Silas, they were severely beaten down. They were bloody and hurt. But what did they do? They get thrown into jail. And what do they do? They have a worship night. Yeah, they have a worship night. They're in jail. And I can imagine the scene being set up like this. Paul says, hey, hey, Silas. Hey, Cy. Hey, what's up, dude? You awake? Oh, yeah. Cy wakes up. Hey, man, I was just thinking, you know, uh, maybe, we should, maybe we should pray. Do you want to sing? Do you want to worship? We don't worship God. I mean, what else are we going to do? And we're going to see this in this next verse that we read. But I can imagine Paul saying to Silas, Sigh, let's just pray and worship God. What else are we going to do? Because I know this. If we're not dead, we're not done. If we're not dead, we're not done. So we're going to pray and worship God. And that's exactly what they did. In fact, in this next verse that we'll read right now, Acts 16, 25, you can hear that. It says, around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. Now this is, nothing has happened yet. They're in prison, okay? They're in prison. Nothing has happened, and they decide to have a worship night. Well, I'm going to give you a spoiler alert. The end of the story is this. In fact, while they are worshiping, God creates an earthquake and the gates open up on these prison cells. The chains fall off their hands and feet and everybody's released. It's not just Paul and Silas, everybody in the whole jail. And so much, it's so scary for the guard that he begins to cry and scream and, and yell and he threatens to take his own life because all the prisoners are going to escape. But Paul and Silas say, hey buddy, it's okay, we're still here. We're just praying and we're worshiping and we're having a worship night. Thank you, God. The biggest mistake that the guards made in that situation was jailing Paul and Silas together. Because together, we can overcome some of these anxieties. Now, one of the things, one of the side effects of anxiety that I've experienced in my life is that when it gets really bad, when I get to having a really bad panic attack, I want to isolate myself. I want to go somewhere dark. I want to go somewhere quiet. I don't want anybody to talk to me. And in fact, I'm scared to even go out anywhere because I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know how I might react. And that's exactly what the devil wants. He wants to isolate you like a sniper. He wants to pick you off when you're by yourself because that's the easiest target. I don't know who needs to hear this today, but the best thing that you did this morning if you're going through this is logging on and watching this service. There's a bunch of crazy people you'll see down here in the comments that are here worshiping and praising God with you. And while we can't all be together, I assure you, friend, that they are praying for you. The devil can't get us when we're together. Now, here's the best part about Paul and Silas beginning to worship. Remember, I gave you the spoiler of what happens. Earthquake, they get freed from prison. But here's what's interesting about their perspective. They began worshiping before God had done anything. They were giving praise before the provision. Why does this matter to us? Because God could have delivered them. He could have delivered them. He could have, he could have made it to where they never ended up going to jail. But they did. They ended up going to jail. And God gave them this ability to begin to sing and worship and, and praise. And the jailers heard it and all the other prisoners heard it. And guess what? God did come. He did move. When Paul's in Philippians, writing the Philippians, God doesn't come. He doesn't come with an earthquake. He doesn't break the chains. He doesn't show up like he did when Paul and Silas were in prison the first time. But that didn't matter. That's what makes this verse in Philippians 4.4, 4, Rejoice in the Lord always, I will say it again, rejoice. Because God, or Paul is putting the praise before the provision. 
And I think that's what you and I can take away from this is the biggest perspective changer in our lives when we're dealing with anxiety. If we praise God before he does anything, if we always praise God for what he has done, who he is, what he's doing in our lives, for being our protector, for guarding our hearts, for protecting us from any weapon that could do harm against us. Guys, this is what God is doing, and that is who God is. In fact, Paul was not praising the what, he was praising the who. This is how this message applies to us today. It's so imperative that we understand that God is always there, even in our times of anxiety. Even in those times that seem really dark, we are to always rejoice. When Paul's in the Philippians, or when he's writing to the Philippians, and he doesn't get released from prison, he still writes this amazing scripture to us. And I love it. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. And that's what I want us to do today. I want you to rejoice today, not for the what, but for the who. All right, we're going to move into our time of communion now. And during this time, I would just like you to think about maybe some of those anxieties in your life that maybe you haven't given to God. Maybe you haven't been giving him praise. And I want to make this very clear, church, that if you praise and worship and pray to God, I'm not saying that your anxieties are going to go away. They might. They might go away, but I'm not saying that they'll go away. But what God wants us to do is always to praise and worship him before the provision even happens, just like Paul modeled when he was in prison. So this morning when we get ready to take communion, I want you to thank God for what he has done and ask him for what you need. We learned about that in week one. And I want you to think about the day. Cast all your cares like we learned about in week two. And today, I want you to give that anxiety to him and praise God, not for the what he is doing or what he has done, but for the who he is. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for everything that you continue to do for us and through us and through this church and for the community, God, that we're able to uh, reach people that the church, while we're not meeting today, is not empty, God. We've just been deployed. We're all over the cities. We're all over northern Colorado. And God, Christians everywhere are deployed, helping out the communities around them. God, I pray that anybody watching this today, if they're struggling with anxiety, if they're struggling with uncertainty and depression, that God, that they would continue to praise you for you, for who you are, because you love us, because you're the way maker, the promise keeper, God. You always do what you say you're going to do. And there is so much refuge in that, God. You are our refuge. Lord, I pray that they will continue to praise before the provision even happens. And Lord, I know that you will come through for all of us like you have always done. God, I pray that you would bless this communion that we're about to take. Thank you for the sacrifice of giving your son that he would die on the cross for our sins, God. And uh, we're so thankful for the opportunity that we have to continue to live in your grace. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
Hello everyone, my name is Jim Perkins. I'm one of the elders here at Traverse Christian Church, and I'm the chairman of our finance committee. This is our first unhindered initiative update. Last fall, we started our unhindered generosity initiative, where we asked families to pledge giving to the church for a two year period. If you're not familiar with unhindered, I'd like to recommend that you go to our website, traversechristian.com slash unhindered and read more about it. There, you can add your family to the, to the list of those who have pledged. It's encouraging to see how generous you have been to our Unhindered initiative. As part of the Unhindered initiative, we had what we called a one fund. With our one fund, we had two buckets. One bucket was for pursue, one bucket was for provide. The monies that we put in provide first provide for the regular expenses of the church. When we had excesses, we would save them in our pursue bucket. I'm encouraged to say that, you, that this church has already saved about $110,000 in our pursue bucket for future expenses. Of the 61 families that pledge to our unhindered initiative, 40% of them are actually meeting or exceeding their pledge. I wanna thank everybody for their faithful generosity and their faithful giving. You will be receiving your first quarterly unhindered report soon. I suggest you read it and talk about it with your family. But I wanted to take the opportunity to thank you for all that you've done to make this possible. I'm so excited with where the Lord is leading this church and I'm really enjoying doing it with all of you. Thank you very much. Hey Traverse, thanks for joining us today. We are so glad that you could be here for Aaron's first time preaching here at Traverse Church. We wish that you could have been here with us as we were doing this, but we know that all of you watching were having as much fun as we were watching Aaron be awesome and a goofball on stage. So uh, we are now moving on to our time of giving, and you can do that two ways. You can do it on the uh, Traverse Church app, Church Center app, um, or you can do it on our website, um, traversechristian.com. Uh, another thing that you need to know is about our social media calendar. If this is the first time you are viewing this, um, we do something every day, either on Facebook or via Zoom, and you can get that in your inbox. If you're not getting the emails, Caleb at traversechristian.com, and he will add you to the list. Um, but you don't want to miss this because I read on Fridays, which is, I don't read on Fridays, I read on Mondays, <laughs> um, which is really fun. We are reading the Jesus Storybook Bible. We do games on Tuesdays, devotionals on Wednesdays, prayer on Thursdays, and student night on Fridays. Um, and we would love to have you join us at any point, either via social media or on Zoom. Um, and last but not least, thank you so much for joining us. We hope to see you next week for Mother's Day. <laughs>